for, for being here today, taking a little bit of time out of your day to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, which is all about everyday actions we can take to build a greater sense of, of belonging at work um, for ourselves, for our colleagues, for people we might manage, uh, for our teams that we lead. And um, so that's where we're gonna go today. And before I share a little bit about myself, I just wanna, for people who might be here um, and wanna know what the, what the next couple of, um, the next 90 minutes cover, um, we're gonna talk all about the foundations of what it means to build belonging. You know, this is a, a topic that is a big topic and one that might feel somewhat abstract or something that might be easy or out of reach depending on your experiences in the workplace. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna kick this off of really kind of dissecting what does it mean to, to build belonging at work? And it starts with psychological safety. It starts with building trust. So we're gonna focus on those two key issues pretty closely. We're gonna understand why it matters obviously to us and also to the future of the workplace. And then the, the great thing at the end um, is we're gonna, we're gonna be able to practice with some very common scenarios, very common microaggressions that we'll talk about um, that pop up in the workplace and what we could do uh, a little bit differently um, applying some of the things that we learn in, in today's conversation. So that's where we're gonna go um, to ensure that we're engaged. You know, I love that people are, are chiming in the chat. So, so Glover and, and Catherine, thank you. Um, I encourage other people who are here. It looks like we've got about 24 people or so. Go ahead and, and, and pop in your comments. You know, um, let us know who you are. You know, maybe introduce yourself, um, share your pronouns if you'd like to. And where are you joining us from? We know some, some folks are on the coast. So uh, thanks for sharing that. And um, as you do that, I just wanna go through some learning agreements so that we feel like we can start building a greater sense of belonging together. Um, and first and foremost, uh, sharing our names and our pronouns if we'd like. You know, to me, I think there's nothing sweeter than the sound of our own names when they're pronounced properly and also our pronouns used properly, right? So um, the cool thing about Zoom is I can see most of your names. So if you'd like to practice sharing your pronouns, if you'd like, go for it. Um, I'm going to be asking questions throughout the conversation, so I'd love it if you, um, when you're responding, to use I statements, right? So, you know, when I'm in the workplace, this is part of my experience, right? Um, speaking using I statements is a really good way of avoiding making generalizations about other people or groups we may not be members of. Also, um, the stories that, that folks are um, bringing into the space, thank you for what you bring. Those are your stories. So um, unless we have consent to share your stories, we're not going to. So we're going to honor your privacy. However, you know, the aha moments that you take from what we learned today from other folks in the space, go ahead and bring those back into your workplace, into your practice, so you can show up as a better version of yourself. Uh, we are learning. So when we're learning, I, I like to assume goodwill, right? Um, we, we're going to make mistakes. We are wired to make mistakes. We're going to learn that today. Um, that's a good thing. And this is a practice space. So I'm not expecting anyone, if we are learning a new music instrument, right? If you're playing the clarinet for the first time, you're probably not going to hit those notes perfectly. And that's a-okay. That's how you, that's how you get better. Um, and in that process, we're going to give each other grace and um, the last thing is uh, please take responsibility for what you need. So some of what might be covered, you might already know. So trust that some of the, the topics uh, might be new for other people and serve them and vice versa. So just kind of take responsibility for what you need. And I think we're gonna have a great conversation. So already folks are chiming in. So thank you so much um, for, for offering up a little bit uh, of who you are and, and why you're joining us. I love it. Um, I'm gonna be checking out the chat box throughout. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Rhodes Perry. I use he, him, his pronouns. And um, I founded my consulting firm in 2015. And what I get to do with clients and business leaders, a lot of folks like yourself, is I get to, I get to coach, I get to consult on helping organizations build a greater sense of psychological safety, trust, and belonging in the workplace. Um, I'm also the author of a best-selling book called Belonging at Work. And that book offers lots of everyday strategies on how you can, how you can start and understanding why belonging really matters and how it can ignite your team to be more creative and more innovative um, when you are establishing these foundations that we're talking about today. And in the preface of my book, uh, I wrote about some of my own workplace experiences 
not so much around belonging, but kind of the, the what happens, the cost of, of not feeling a sense of belonging. And, um, and I'd like to just kind of share a little summary of what's, what's in that preface, which is just kind of starting out with where I worked uh, in 2006. So I, I worked at the White House uh, at that time, and I 100% did not feel safe in that job. And it was kind of a bummer because the job itself was really cool. I got to manage a budget of $11 billion when I was all of 26. And I was super grateful for the opportunity, yet I found myself almost um, pretty consistently at the end of every day, emotionally exhausted and disconnected from my team. And the static was that everyday exchanges, really simple, honest, everyday exchanges were loaded with kind of this tightrope dance of mental gymnastics and a sprinkle of historical sensory. And so an example, you know, I would be at the water cooler uh, and a colleague would come up just trying to, to have a connection and would ask, hey Rhodes, what sports did you play in high school? Again, there's nothing wrong with that question, uh, but for me that the response wasn't so simple. Uh, you know, I'd stall first because I really didn't want to answer it. Um, and in my heart, you know, I wanted to say the truth. I wanted to say that I played women's fast pitch softball for 16 years. I was pretty good. It was a, a great place to, to, to build community, to learn leadership skills, um, et cetera. But um, I wanted to avoid confusion for my colleagues. So I, you know, might have wanted to say I played baseball, that would have been safer. And I didn't want to lie. So I settled with this disclosing that I ran high school cross country. And um, it was a safe response. Uh, it was a great pivot. It got the attention off of me. And maybe at this point, for some of you who might not be familiar with who I am, you might be wondering why a guy like me was playing women's fast pitch softball for so many years. Um, and I am a transgender guy. And, um, and while my colleagues got my name and my pronouns correct, even though I wasn't out about my gender history, I felt unsafe and lacked a sense of trust to share more about who I am. And for those, anyone who's unfamiliar with transgender men, I was assigned female at birth and socialized as a girl and a young woman uh, before transitioning. And I, I really believe that my gender history offers a powerful perspective in life and absolutely the workplace. However, going back to the water cooler exchange, that was a really tame example of, of more complicated self-censorship I had to do on a daily basis. Uh, there were a lot of stories that I wanted to share to build trust and rapport with my colleagues. And yet in 2006, I was pretty confident I was likely the first transgender person many on my team would encounter. And at that time, I didn't wanna serve as the office educator. So I continued to censor a, a really precious part of who I am. And um, ultimately I, I failed at that job. Uh, I failed namely in trusting my colleagues to share that really important aspect of who I am. And another truth is that the White House failed me at that time and not offering a sense of safety, uh, namely job security. Uh, so at that time there were no job protections for transgender workers. And this communicated to me that bringing my real self to work would come at, at a great risk. Uh, a risk where I could even lose my job if I was more honest about who I am. And while I might be the first out trans person some of you have had the chance to meet today virtually, uh, I am probably not the first transgender person you've encountered. And um, today it's not talking about transgender workplace matters though, that's something that I, I like talking about from time to time. Uh, what we are talking about today is a workplace epidemic of exclusion and othering and how we as the people that we are today, no matter our role, what we can do to change this. So kind of like just digesting that story, right? I, I, want, to, I want you to kind of connect with your own workplace experiences of, of, on this topic of belonging um, and also kind of the, 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 the harder parts of, of this um, showing up at work when you feel excluded or othered. And I wanna kinda check in with you and get a sense of, uh, you know, have you ever felt a lack of safety or trust on the job? You know, just kinda think about it. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. This is just your experience, but really kind of like, just kind of do an audit in your head of all the jobs that you've ever had. 
have you ever felt, you know, uh, some kind of static that gets in the way of building a connection with your colleagues? Um, and this could be a time uh, where you needed to hide an important aspect of who you are in order to quote unquote fit in. And so as you're kind of like reviewing all those jobs, right? Um, if you're nodding, you know, or if you're silently saying, yeah, you know, I've, I felt that before. Just think about what important part of yourself you, you had to cover, conceal, or hide, or even leave behind entirely in order to protect your job or your career ambitions. So like a simple question here is, what was the cost to you? And as you're thinking about that, you know, just kind of take a few minutes and um, maybe share, right? Like if you can relate to this, maybe share a feeling, you know, like in one word, you know, we've got 38 people here. I would love to see maybe 38 different words or feelings if this is something that does resonate for you on, on what, that, what that experience is like, right? Um, Jean, thank you, invisible, yeah. Invisible um, is, is a kind of an isolating feeling. You know, that's something that when I shared my story with you, that was really, that was the thing. It's like, um, you know, I feel alone and I'm not really sure you're gonna understand me if I share more about who I am. Um, Sheila says, no ground. Huh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, uh, uh, Laura says isolated. Yeah, for sure. So we connected on that. Disconnected, right? So um, we'll talk about engagement um, and, and why that's important and what gets in the way of engagement. This is, a, this is certainly a piece of it, that exclusion. Um, Kim says, not the right, not the right fit not the right fit, right? So, you know, we'll talk about what, what does it even mean, you know, fit, um, which is kind of a loaded term. So we'll talk about that. Um, disconnected, Gina, thank you. Oh, Gina, it's good to see you. Um, the familiar face there. Um, uh, Maria says restricted. Yeah, yeah, you're kind of like in a, you're, you're in a box. You're forcing yourself in a box. You don't really fit in. Um, Alexandra says anxious. Um, Carrie says ostracized. Sheila says not feeling that I have grounding. Uh, almost physically, no, no safe space, right? Um, Van says small, right? Unimportant, shame, uneasy, tense. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you all for offering. You know some of these feelings that we don't like these kind of feelings, right? These are the kind of feelings we want to turn away from, um, maybe not talk a lot about because there is that shame piece of it. Um, I recently heard uh, a quote around shame that if shame is is taking place, and in particular in the workplace you can't perform, your brain is not functioning, it's not firing at its, at, at its fullest. You can't share your genius, your, your talent. So um, thank you for that, thank you for that. What I wanna do now is that because we've, we've identified some negative emotions um, of what it's like to feel excluded and othered, uh, I want us to have the opportunity to really feel into um, what, what it's like you know, to, to feel a sense of belonging and in this context in the workplace. And so I'm very much into imagination exercises. So um, if, you will, if you will trust the process, if it's available to you, I'd love for you to kind of close your eyes, you know, maybe take a deep breath, um, just kind of ground yourself right now. Um, and, and I want you to imagine with me, you know, so again, if you can close your eyes, take a deep breath in and think about this. So when you're seen at work, whether online or in person, some kind of hybrid situation in the workplace, when you are seen, you are recognized by your colleagues, you're rewarded by your supervisors when you do a good job, and you feel a sense of respect when you show up in the workplace. And as you're kind of like thinking about this, as you're imagining it, you may experience this already. If you do, that's amazing. Um, just kind of locate what that feeling is for you. Um, and then where do you feel it in your body? Right, you know, you're feeling this this great sense of really being seen for who you are in the workplace, and building on that, um, when you're when you're engaged in the workplace, right? We talked about disconnection in this moment. When you're engaged, um, you're feeling connected. You're feeling you're you're having a positive, authentic. You're you're experiencing social interactions that feel like you can you can be aligned with your values. You can share what's most precious to you to build a stronger team. Um, what, what feeling shows up for you there, you know, um, when you're engaged with your peers, your managers, your senior leaders, you're feeling connected, uh, and just notice where you feel that in your body. And then just like two more things to build on in this imagination exercise. 
when you're supported at work, those around you, from your peers to senior leaders, they're giving you what you need so that you can do your best work. So you're getting what you need. You, can, you have the space to ask for what you need. So how does that feel? Is that something that you consistently feel right now? What would it feel like if you felt that again and again every day that you showed up? And then last, this last piece in the imagination exercise is when you are proud of your work, you know, you've done, you finished a project, you did something that contributed to the common purpose of your team, you feel aligned not only with your team's purpose, but the, the, whole, the whole mission of your organization. You're in alignment with the vision and the values. Um, and those values reflect your own, right? How does that feel for you? So just kind of really sit in, in, in kind of these four different aspects of, of feeling a sense of belonging at work. And as you're kind of feeling into that, um, if your eyes are still closed, you know, I just encourage you to kind of open your eyes back up, come back into the space and um, just kind of like sit into those feelings. And, um, and I wanna know, I wanna know just kind of like in general, was there like one or two feelings that kind of popped up for you? And if so, um, I'd love to kind of see what, what shows up for you. Sheila, awesome. Okay, um, feeling open in my chest area. It's almost childlike, very open, dynamic, exciting, deep connection, not worried about being wrong. Um, you want others, your team to feel the same. I feel centered and solid. But you like, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for offering all of that. You know, that's, that is the essence, right? Like when we're talking about the sense of belonging at work, you, you really, you did a great job. Um, so thank you for that. Gene says feeling fully human, right? Like you're not a cog, you know, like you're being seen for who you are, what you're bringing to your, to your, to your team and to your workplace. Um, Julianne says, appreciated. I felt it in my heart. Yes. I love that. Um, Catherine says, productive, creative. Um, Yes, there's, there's lots of gratitude for Sheila. Thank you again, that was great. Um, Catherine says motivated. Violet says feeling relaxed and awake. Um, we're seeing motivated, encouraged, whole, lightness, se secure, confident, safe, felt it in my stomach. Yeah, so right, you know, and again, we're talking about feelings, right? And we're gonna connect why feelings matter at work, right? This is the space where, you know, we can bring, we can bring all of it, the good and the bad. So, um, so just a couple of like follow-up questions. You don't necessarily have to answer them in the chat. If you feel compelled, you can, but I want you to think about these as well. So how would it feel if you didn't have to cover those aspects that are most precious to you in the workplace? The things that if you could share them, if you felt safe enough, you could, your team could understand you more deeply um, and that their the trust could be more present, right? So just how would that feel for you? Um, if you could be, if you could bring more of yourself into your role, uh, and if you were in a leadership role in particular, how would that impact those that you manage, right? So thinking about if you can show up more fully, how can you then be more present for your for for those folks that you're leading? And then the last piece that I really want you to think about, and this is really important for those of you where you're you're thinking about belonging, you're like, yeah, I, I feel great, my team gets me, I feel like I can be myself. If that's you. Um, I want you to kind of sit with this question, you know, for those on your team who are the least likely to feel safe, they may be historically excluded from the workplace altogether, right? Thinking about those folks, how might their experiences on the job change uh, if these feelings were present for them, right? So this is a little bit more abstract from your own experience, but trying to bridge uh, the gap between another person's worldview just try to lean into that. How might that shift? And how could that impact your organization? So, um, so I'm just gonna take a look at the chat really quickly. Um, and I'm seeing energized flow, whole scene, radiant. Uh, and then Catherine says less complicated, more time to think about other stuff, right? More time to, right? You're not, you're not kind of operating part, part of your brain kind of focused on how am I doing? Where am, where am I at? Am I safe? Do I trust those around me, right? So um, the idea of this visualization exercise is just to kind of pull the curtain back upon a world where our workplaces have, maybe for some of us, or more painfully, you know, the reality for others have not created a sense of safety and trust. So let's just kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about hiding and concealing. Um, I want to talk about this, this piece around covering. And this is, uh, this is work that was done by Kenji Yoshino. He's based out of NYU Law School. He's done a lot of work on this. Um, 
And what he's found in his research is that unfortunately, many workplaces fail at centering the core values of building psychological safety and trust, right? Um, and that may explain why about 75% of most workers in the US consciously downplay or hide important parts of who they are in the workplace. And that kind of hiding is what Kenji Yoshino calls covering, right? It's protective. Uh, we, we cover what's most precious to us, what we're afraid will get hurt on the job in order to get ahead, to go along, to get along, and to go back to what some folks have said to fit in, right? Um, and, and I want you all just to kind of sit with this because covering brings its own pain, right? It, it requires that we brutally extract some of the most important parts of who we are um, in order to say, yes, you know, I measure up, yes, I matter, yes, I belong, you know, um, but we're, we're fitting ourselves into a box that's not really who we are. Um, and covering then encourages us to conform, which makes us feel isolated and excluded. It makes us feel unsafe and it erodes any trust that we may have built with our colleagues. So, um, something to think about, right? And this gets to this piece around fit. Um, earlier, earlier in my career, you know, I had a great mentor who once encouraged me to consider these, these three questions before I make a job offer to a candidate. So kind of like a younger manager type of role. Um, those three questions are, can the person do the job, right? A good question to ask. Um, will they do the job? You know, is there motivation? Are they inspired? And this last piece, you know, do they fit in? Is there a culture fit or do they belong here in this environment? So um, just kind of like a yes or no uh, is, you know, how many of you all consider some of these questions, whether you're making an important hiring decision if you're in that role um, or, you know, you're considering your next kind of great opportunity. So just kind of like a yes or no. I imagine, you know, yeah. So thank you, Van. I imagine for a lot of you all, yeah, of course, you know, I consider these questions. Um, yeah, right. Uh, I, I have found that these three questions are, are pretty essential. Um, ooh, I like this. Um, Kaylin, thank you. Um, reframing the last question, what would, what would they add to our culture? Huh, I like that. Okay, so you're, you're ahead of the gang there. So I like that. Um, for me, like I have found these three questions really essential um, before making a great hire or even thinking about what my next steps are in my career. And um, even so, you know, that, that last question, you know, does this candidate fit here? Do I fit here? Um, do I belong, right? Um, that was much harder to answer, uh, especially when, when making hiring decisions, working in organizations that fail to even define what an intentional culture is. Certainly you could look around, there's an implicit culture, but very few of the organizations I worked at had defined what their culture is and where, where they want to steer it towards to be more equitable, right? And, um, and what I'd like to say here is that if a workplace fails to define its culture, how are, you going, how are you going to even be able to objectively evaluate that last question? And um, to Kaylin's question, I love that reframe. What would this particular candidate add to our culture? Well, that's gonna be hard to answer too if, the, if that culture hasn't been defined by the organization. So but the first step there um, on, on this work is really thinking about, do we define our culture, right? Um, and whether we know it or not, every time we move throughout our organization, we can go from office to office, we're in virtual space now, we can go from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting. Uh, we're gonna audit the culture, oftentimes subconsciously, and how we do that is really simple. Subconsciously, often we're doing this. Am I safe and do I trust those around me? You might have asked that kind of coming into this space. Hopefully you're feeling, hopefully you're feeling a little bit of safety and trust, right? Um, but you can go to your next meeting and that could be a completely, the responses that you have can be completely different because the context has shifted, right? Um, those questions, am I safe and do I trust those around me? That's, those are the building blocks of belonging, psychological safety and trust. You're learning a lot about that in the series. And the reality is like, if we answer yes to each of these questions, we're more likely to feel a strong sense of belonging. And that's really critical that we feel it in the workplace because it is so essential to our health, our well being, our productivity. Um, and in leading businesses around the globe are, are prioritizing this work, which is great. Um, and so, to truly cultivate belonging in our virtual work, 
inclusive leaders, many of you all are on the path of building up your inclusive leadership skills. You all are encouraged to answer this question. Who, who are we intentionally including, right? If you can answer that. And who are we unintentionally excluding? So that last piece, who are we unintentionally excluding? That's, that's, that's a deeper one to answer, right? And it requires, it requires some work. So to answer that question, right? We need to have a better understanding of what these building blocks of belonging are all about. And um, featured on the screen, you probably are familiar with Amy Edmondson's work. She's amazing. She's done a lot of foundational research around what does it mean to, to, to be psychologically safe? Um, if you're not familiar with her work, uh, one, one kind of aspect of her research uh, was about 10 years ago, she studied teams and hospital settings to find out if better performing teams made fewer mistakes. And great kind of question to, to kind of like, you know, ask. And you might think better performing teams, yeah, they probably don't make a, a lot of mistakes. But her research actually found the opposite, right? She said, you know, when she was kind of reviewing the research on the surface, it appeared that better performing teams actually made more mistakes. So that kind of threw her for a loop and she wanted to kind of explore that. And when she took a deeper dive, she discovered a more profound story. The more cohesive a team was, right? The more likely they were to report their mistakes or their failures. And they were more likely, or they were more willing to discuss their failures and work through them. So that's really key. It was really profound and interesting. So that led her to ask a, a completely different question. What made these teams so cohesive? That's what she wanted to kind of unpack. And what she found out is that these teams had a strong sense of psychological safety. So basically this means, and I know you, you've been kind of exploring psychological safety a lot. So from her work and the way she talks about it, um, it meant that the team members felt accepted and respected to show up as their real selves without fear of negative consequences, right? So you can share what's most precious to you and not fear that you're gonna lose your job, right? Um, and because of this strong sense of psychological safety, team members trusted each other with their ideas. They were more likely to take risks without fear. And that kind of risk-taking often leads teams to, to fail faster. And that might sound scary. That might sound like, oh, we don't want failure, it's bad. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a business owner. There, there might be many of you all who are business owners here. You know, many of us know that that's a simple business strategy that allows us to quickly and cheaply validate new ideas, products, or services before making a big financial investment and finding out if it's serving a need, if it's meeting a need. Um, and when, when we fail faster, we get closer to where that innovation, where that breakthrough is, right? So if you've not cultivated a strong sense of psychological safety on your team, failing faster is definitely not gonna be an option. And if that is not an option, then innovation, creativity, business breakthroughs, that's not gonna happen either, right? So now that you've got a, a kind of a better understanding on the importance of psychological safety, let's hear from Amy herself. Let's, I mean, she is the guru around psychological safety when it comes to building cohesive teams. Um, and as you, as you watch this very short clip, she does an awesome job of just kind of defining what we're exploring today. Um, really consider how she defines psychological safety. And then uh, some of the ideas that she shares for you all on ways to cultivate it in your workplace, on your teams, right? And um, then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll debrief as a group. So let's, let's give this a watch um, and uh, let's, hopefully this will work out. And if you can't hear the sound, just let me know. Sweet. Your work on psychological safety was famously cited by Google um, in their research into what makes a great team. But what exactly is psychological safety? You know, it's a shared belief, right? It's a shared belief that the environment is conducive to interpersonal risks, like asking for help or admitting a mistake or criticizing a project. And 
that can be challenging to do. So this is the sort of sense that this is a special place where that kind of activity is okay. Now, it's not being nice or soft or, you know, guaranteed applause for everything you have to say. It's also not permission to whine and it's not uh, permission to slack off, right? It's a, it's a, a kind of very energizing but, but, but candid place. So you see, it's almost, that, as you said, it's kind of creating that environment for people to speak up, um, yes. to be honest as such. Full stop, right? Easier said than done. Yes, yes. So I suppose that leads to the next question. What steps should leaders take to create psychological safety? You know, to me, it, it starts with, and this is a, in the midst of, of COVID, a good time to talk about this, because I think it starts with being utterly clear and transparent about what we're up against. Um, and specifically, I mean the enormous uncertainty and, and complexity and challenge of what we face. And when leaders are, that's, I call that setting the stage. And when you're setting the stage by reminding people of what you might argue we already know, but I think it still needs to be said, you're essentially setting the rationale for why their voice might be needed. Right? Clearly, anyone could see something that you miss or that others miss. So it starts with setting the stage, but it's also about being proactive and inviting voice. You can't just say, well, gee, I'm really eager to hear from people and I'm sure they know that. You have to be proactive. You have to say, what's on your mind? What are you seeing? What concerns do you have? What questions do you have? And, and just um, make it more difficult for people to remain silent than to speak up because you've issued those invitations. Yeah. And then, of course, it really matters how you respond. You know, you, you, you must not shoot the messenger. When people come forward with ideas or, or bad news or anything else, you have to just take a deep breath and respond in a forward-looking, appreciative manner. And, and all of those things contribute to creating psychological safety. In this... All right. So... Um... It goes fast, right? And there's a lot to what, what Amy shares in that video. So um, I just wanna go back to those two questions that I had asked you all. Um, the first is just kind of, if you were to describe Amy's definition of psychological safety, how, how would you describe that to someone who might not be on, on this webinar? So if you wanna give yourself kind of a minute or two to think about that, um, I'd love for you to kind of drop that into the chat and I'll see what pops up for you all. Um, she did. She did share kind of three core things that are part of psychological safety when we're thinking about teams, right? So, um, if you want to share some of that in the chat, go for it. Um, and don't worry, I'll, I'll share. I'll, I'll give you give you all the at least kind of my responses to that. And then um, the second piece too is like, if you were tasked now that you have a better sense of how to cultivate psychological safety, um, and this is particularly for those of you all who are in leadership positions. What might be some of the ways uh, that you would set the stage, as Amy says? How would you set the stage to make it more difficult uh, for people to remain silent? So um, uh, thank you, Catherine. So be honest and don't patronize, right? So, um, so that comes from that kind of fear of like letting go of the fear of negative consequences. Like, to have psychological safety allows you to have that honesty, right? So that's that's a good that's a good kind of reminder of what it's about. Um, Sheila says, "I found that you must have allies in proximity, especially if you're if you're stepping out, you know, and bringing forward concerns, right? Yeah, I think that that's really key when we're thinking about on our team. You know, we're going to take a risk, um, and if psychological safety is present." It shouldn't feel like we're taking a risk, right? So that's that's a kind of key thing. So if we're if we're finding that we're in an environment where we do need those kind of we need proximity to kind of co-conspirators or allies, you know, folks that are going to engage in acts of allyship when we share our ideas, that might be an indicator we've got some work to do on our team to beef up psychological safety. And I really like that. I like that kind of strategy of like, if it's not fully present there, that's where kind of those co-conspirators can come in. So thank you for that, Sheila. Um, 
Let's see. And then uh, Jean says, not wanting to have all the answers for everything, but admitting when you don't know, especially as a leader. Oh my gosh, yeah. So for, for psychological safety for everyone, you could be a leader, you could be kind of a team member, right? It's that first piece that she talks about is being able to admit, you know, hey, like I made a mistake or as a team, it, look, it looks like, you know, we need to course correct because we're not doing the thing that we thought we were going to going to do, you know, we, we've, we made a mistake, right? But being able to say that, right? Um, without the fear of negative consequences. So that's like a really big piece. Um, one of the things that I wanna kind of build on that, that, that Jean adds is like making a mistake is a piece like you, that you can admit to that, but also raising your hand to ask for help, right? It could be about a mistake that was made. It could be about like, I don't really understand what my, my new role is, you know, or, you know, so being able to raise your hand and ask for help without fear of negative consequences. That's the second component of psychological safety as Amy describes it. And um, let's see um, if you all got to the third component here. Um, so Yvonne says to have a value in the organization where error is seen as a possibility for learning faster, right? Yeah. So like kind of, you know, admit a mistake, great, we made a mistake or like, you know, we totally failed on this piece, but how do we come back? We're still going to have to do this project. So how do we problem solve, right? That's going to get you closer to doing something even better, right? If there's not the fear of negative consequences. Um, Kim says, my view is that psychological safety means that everyone can step forward to raise concerns, ideas. Yes. Okay. So that's the third piece, Kim. Thank you for that. So that is being able to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm kind of on the front lines. I've been doing this process for the past 10 years. And here's like six new ideas to do this thing better, to be able to offer that constructive feedback, right? And that there's space to do it, you know, that your leaders are open to hearing that. And if you're a leader, you're open, right? You're setting the stage of making it harder for people to remain silent on ideas to improve a process. So if you're in that leadership role, it's like, being open to feedback and what Amy was saying, like, you must not shoot the messenger. So sorry for the violence there, but like, you can't go after people that are trying to help and making something better. Um, and if you're able to cultivate those three things, or if they're present already in your workplace, then chances are psychological safety is high. However, right, like if it feels like on your team, you need kind of like allies to kind of do these things, then that's a sign like there's work to be done around psychological safety. So I just wanted to make sure we really understand that. Um, and I'll try to like scroll through here a little bit of what, what other things people have offered. So proactive invitation for team members to bring their full selves. Creating space is not just an act of allowing, right? Yeah. And that that comes from like, I can, I can share what's most precious to myself because I know my team has, has my back. I don't have to fear losing my job or not getting a stretch assignment or not getting that promotion, right? So this is a really good work. Um, really, really good work here. Um, stinky fish exercise is good. Uh, I would love to know about that. I'm not, not familiar with that. So, um, so thank you for that, Kim. Um, Van says psychological safety can be created by leadership who model being vulnerable and transparent about their flaws. Yes, being human goes a long way, especially if you are in a leadership role and you can share um, a time when you messed up, you know, it could be a, a job that someone else has on your team just to be like, hey, you know, I'm going to be a little vulnerable here when I first, you know, like the story that I shared with you all about the White House, you know, feeling like I failed at that job because I didn't trust my teammates, right? You know, like just kind of vulnerability goes a really long way of building connection, right? Like vulnerability kind of mixed with empathy drives connection. And that comes from Brene Brown's research, right? And, um, Without that empathy, you know, without vulnerability, that drives disconnection. And it's like the last thing that you want to have in your organization. So this is a key component to prevent that from happening. Um, let's see. How can I bring this concept to my leadership team? Bring Amy Edmondson in. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, sharing what you're learning here, right? Um, there's a, a really great book um, about the components of psychological safety. Um, and I'm pretty sure that was written by Richard Clark. Um, and it's usually on my shelf next to me. I don't see it there. Um, but there's a, there's a number of resources. And um, that's something that I, I will share with you all after is like how you can continue learning. You'll get a participant handout guide. You can share some of those resource, resources with uh, your leadership team. 
there's lots of good books out there. The book that I wrote around belonging at work can be a place where people can start. Um, and and it's, it behooves leadership teams to invest the time to go through executive coaching or this kind of learning so that they can understand the value of vulnerability and establishing psychological safety, setting that stage. So just some ideas kind of off, off the hand there. Um, so we'll get, I'll get to some of the more detailed questions. We're gonna have time at the end. I just wanna make sure that we cover trust building too. So that's where I'm gonna go next. Um, and we can watch that video again. Um, so, so trust is that second building block to establishing a sense of belonging in the workplace. And it has to be in the room. If, if we're going to be confident and asking for help, admitting to a mistake or offering constructive feedback, right? If we don't trust, if we fear negative consequences, that's not going to happen. Um, and the good news is you could be in a, a, a position of leadership or not. Um, you don't have to be a capital L leader to develop trust. That's something that's available to all of us. Chances are when you think about relationships where there's a lot of love, you know, there's probably a lot of trust there. So you know how to do this. We are wired to try to build trust. In fact, we start with trust and it's when trust is eroded or broken that's when it becomes a challenge. And, and, and tragically, when we think about our workplaces, you know, good intentions often cause unintended consequences. It often causes impact that causes harm and sometimes breaks trust. And so oftentimes in, in the work that I do, I'm called to come in to help teams rebuild trust and, and kind of at least create the space to start rebuilding trust. And we know if you've ever had a relationship where trust has been broken, it takes a long time if it can ever be repaired, right? So let's start with like trying to like really build up our muscles and, and kind of creating trust from the beginning and maintaining it, right? So um, there's a couple of components that I feature up on the screen here that I think are helpful places to start, um, helpful places to build up your muscles, to be more aware of how you build trust because you do it all the time, right? So the first thing is we have to practice Sonder. And Sonder is a really cool concept I learned um, a couple of years ago, and I love it. So Sonder reminds us, right, that each person's world is filled with their own ambitions, their own friends, routines, fears, joys, beliefs, and behaviors. And the, the reality of Sonder is that these rich inner worlds of random people that we happen to pass every day are 100% invisible to us, right? Like the only worldview that we know intimately is our own. And the reality is that there's billions and billions of other worldviews on this planet, right? So to, to really fully understand this concept, you know, maybe think of a time when you may have disagreed with a colleague's approach to, to solving a problem, right? And try to recall their perspective and, and why you disagreed with them, right? So just kind of draw on, on something that many of us have probably encountered, right? Now, in the context of building trust with your colleagues, right, um, and you're in disagreement, you can't simply bear witness to their perspective and then get defensive and come up with a story about why they might be terrible at their jobs because they happen to disagree with your perspective, right? Like that's, that's going to be a recipe for nobody. <laughs> Nobody's going to be happy about whatever that end result is. Um, in order to build trust in this kind of scenario, um, you, you know, and I, and anybody who finds themselves in scenarios like this, which is most of us, we have to flex our empathy muscles and practice what Saunders is all about. So it is that realization that your colleague's worldview was shaped by the vivid and complex lives that they lead, right? And when you practice Sonder, you can escape this moral matrix of, you know, I'm right, they're wrong. Um, and, and, and instead, if you can park that aside, um, you can start to gain an appreciation for why your colleague is wired the way that they are, why they approach solving the problem that's at hand in the way that they want to. Um, and you don't have to agree with their worldview. You don't have to agree um, with, with all the things that shaped who they are. Um, yet, if you're successful at kind of getting uh, understanding, right, uh, about the, the worldviews of your, of your colleague or colleagues, um, you can start to draw connections between your colleagues' perspective, their approach to solving a problem, and your own, right? You're moving out of this moral matrix of right versus wrong, and you're trying to get to yes, right? And from there, you can develop this shared understanding of how to move forward. That does 
you know, it requires having margin. It requires having some space in your day to take a beat and to really have an interaction. I would encourage, you know, whether it's on Zoom or a phone call, but really taking the time to have connection so that you're not, you're not kind of like amping up any kind of conflict that's taking place. Conflict is good, right? But you want to try to move, move through it, right? So Sandra can kind of help with that, of just remembering not everybody is wired the way that you are, um, and you, you want to understand why. You want to get a better understanding of who your colleagues are. So Sonder is a piece of trust building, right? We're, we're being respectful of other people and their worldviews. Um, the second piece is, is deep listening. And you might say, you know, I've heard about deep listening, active listening. I do it all the time. I get it. Um, this is a skill. This is a skill that you may feel confident in. And remember, we live in a world of constant distractions. I'm looking for my phone, right? How often does this thing beep? And I mean, I just looked at it. There's, there's millions of different beeps and buzzes going on right now, right? So even if you feel like you're a good listener and it comes natural to you, we live in a world of constant distractions, right? And um, if, we want to, if we want to build trust, we're going to have to, we have to bear witness to those that we work with. We need to give them space. We need to let them know. Remember in that imagination exercise we did, we want to, we want to feel seen and appreciated for who we are. We have to do that for others, right? And, and give more of that to others, right? Model it. And that's where deep listening comes in. So um, it requires a couple of things, you know, there is, there's the basics, right? Like if, a colleague is coming to you, and this is for leaders, right? You're in a leadership role, you're going a mile a minute. You have someone who is practicing, you know, elements of psychological safety. Hey Rhodes, you know, I have a question, you know, I need, I need some help, do you have some time? You're the leader, you know, make the time. You know, you, have a, you, you wanna support, you wanna develop your team, right? So the first thing, make some time, you know, um, give to your team and then be present, right? So if it's in person, right? or even on Zoom, you know, just kind of like being present, like looking into the camera if we're in a virtual space, all kind of five point, you've got your shoulders, you've got your face, you've got your hips, it facing the person, you know, that you're, that, that is in front of you, those nonverbals go a long way, right? Um, listening, you know, really like listening for understanding, not listening for a response. So really just kind of being present and understanding what, what the challenge is at hand and then, you know, before coming up with your great idea as a leader who's supportive, repeat back what you just listened to, right? To ask, hey, did I get that right? You said that you needed help with this new IT program that we're rolling out. Um, and here's where the challenges are for you. Did I get that right? Is that where you're struggling? And then that allows the person who's sharing with you to editorialize of like, well, yeah, you got that part right, but here's where I'm really struggling, right? That's listening to understand. That's deep listening and it's listening without distraction. So again, that this might be something that you've been trained on again and again. It's a skill and it's one of those skills that is kind of depleting every day that we get new, new distractions in our life, right? Because of technology. So, so that's the second piece of the deep listening. And then the third, and this one's really, really, really important. And it requires us to, to let go of something that I think, at least for myself, you know, I'm gonna speak using the I statements I grew up with, I grew up with the golden rule, right? Treat others in a way in which they, in which you want to be treated, right? Um, so the golden rule is something that we as leaders, I encourage you, you know, if it's available to you, let go of the golden rule and lean into the platinum rule. So if you're not familiar with the platinum rule, the pl platinum rule is treat others in a way in which they want to be treated, right? Treat others in a way, in a manner in which they want to be treated. How do we know how another person wants to be treated, right? That goes back to Sonder. That goes back to deep listening. We have to remember, not everybody, you know, like I love riding my bike, you know, and I would feel so awesome if someone gave me like, hey, hey Rhodes, here's like registration to ride 100 miles in the century, right? <laughs> not everybody wants to ride their bike 100 miles on a Saturday morning, right? So if I was doing the golden rule, I might give that to all 38 of you all, right? chances are probably 37 of you all would say, no, thank you. <laughs> um, so that would be the golden rule. Uh, the platinum rule is that there's 38 people on this call. Um, if I wanted to treat any one of you in the ways that you, in which you wanna be treated, I need to know who you are. I need to take the time to understand the things that matter to you. I need to understand as leaders, right? In the workplace setting, right? I need to understand when you do a job well, 
what's like beyond, you know, compensate well, you know, promote people, that's great, right? But what are the ways that would recognize, like, like allow an employee that you, you lead, that you manage, a way that they feel truly seen? A little things, right? You know, it could be, you know, I don't know getting me in addition to a raise, you know, and a bonus, like a nice bicycle mug or something like that, just, you know, the little things. So um, that's where the platinum rule comes in. So, um, you know, uh, there's a Dale Carnegie quote I, I put in here, but it's um, the royal road to a person's heart is to talk to them about the things they treasure most. So that's another way of kind of thinking about this platinum rule. So how will you know um, what your colleagues treasure most, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to practice Sonder, right? So that's just kind of um, some, some things to kind of chew on there. Um, so this is a trust building exercise I normally do like outside of webinars. Um, but what I'd like for you all to do is just to kind of practice this. Maybe um, you, you can, you can do this after this workshop today and maybe work with, with someone in your office, maybe a loved one, a friend, you can even, I have pets here. You can even practice with a pet just to kind of get used to, used to the words of, of saying how to build trust. But this, this would be an exercise to do. So um, if you can, if you'd like to, I'd encourage you just to kind of write this down and I'll give you some directions. So you have a little bit of homework if you want to take your skills to the next level. Um, but on like a piece of paper, or you can write it down yourself. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. So the platinum rule resonates. Very cool. All right. So, so test this out. Try this out. Um, you can write this down now um, and then practice later. Um, and I'll kind of model for you all. Um, I'd love for you to write your, what your job is, what you do. Um, and for me, you know, I run my own business. I help business leaders build psychological safety, trust and belonging at work. So that's a little bit of what I do. You don't have to overthink this. It can be super short. Um, the second is kind of thinking about the three most important people in your life. Um, for me, that would be probably my parents, my brother, you know, and you probably can go on and on. If you can't think of people, think of like your pets, you know, think of um, animals that you like. Um, then moving from that, you know, the three most important events in your life. So for me, I might say, you know, coming out was definitely a big deal for me. You know, graduating from college was a big deal. Um, you know, moving to Portland with my partner, that was exciting. You know, so, so just kind of think about those things that are most precious to you, right? And then this last piece is the three things you enjoy doing during your free time. So I shared with you, I like biking, you know, um, I love reading, um, I love traveling when I can, you know, so just kind of think about those things. Really easy, hopefully you're able to answer those right now. Um, and when you, when you, uh, when you get home, this is, this is what I would encourage you to practice. So um, think about connecting with another person and sitting down with them for five minutes each, you know, and ask them to do the same thing. Um, and then and it could be good if you could do it with a colleague, right? Because this could actually help with team cohesion. Um, and then for those five minutes, if you're familiar with diets, right, is um, thinking about you have five minutes to kind of share what feels feels available to you, what you can share. Um, and then allow that person just to listen for five minutes and ask them to reflect back um, what they what they listen to, you know, and, and leave room for kind of editorializing if they got it right or if you want to add more. And then switch and just kind of practice how that feels in particular for you, in particular for you to deeply listen and get a better sense of, of some of those basic questions that sometimes we we don't ask of other people um, and, and see what comes out of it. But really this exercise is just to kind of help you practice what we just kind of learned as a framework. And again, it's a little bit harder on a webinar to do this uh, together, but um, that's something that I encourage you to kind of like, kind of chew on, think about, and then kind of practice. And maybe this could be a team building exercise you can do with your colleagues, but that's there for you to just kind of practice out. How do I kind of, practice these elements of building trust with someone else. And I think what will come out of that, if you do it, which I hope you do, I think you'll kind of learn a little bit about how, how easy it is for you to listen for a full five minutes uninterrupted. You know, you can time it on your phone um, and see, see if, you know, that's something that you need to kind of continue practicing, you know, and, and you can do this a little bit more informally, you know, with, with your team, you know, with a colleague or, or someone that you, you manage. 
um, if you have one-on-ones, you know, just kind of like silently practice this, you know, for five minutes, just kind of listen and continue asking questions to understand someone else's worldview. That's where you're practicing Sonder. So that's something for you. That's a gift. If you'd like to practice it, if you're, if that feels a little too risky for you right now, that's okay. Um, but you have the framework. So, um, so this is usually where we would debrief if we were kind of doing this, uh, not, not in a webinar, um, but that's again for you uh, to, to consider. So let's just kind of talk about um, the why. You know, we talked about just briefly, you know, it's one slide, but I just want you to kind of like wrap your mind around um, why the foundations of belonging, of psychological safety and trust are so important. So um, we know, you know, when we think about um, the hierarchy of needs, you know, love and belonging is above kind of food, water, and shelter, that's, that's essential. You know, we are wired for this. And it's so essential in kind of all of our relationships, including the workplace. The workplace is not devoid of, of this need, right? And again, going back to Kenji Yoshino's research, 75% of us feel the need to cover, to hide something that's important to us, precious to us. Um, it also may explain why about 40% of people say that they feel isolated at work. Um, this epidemic of exclusion and othering leads to isolation. You know, that, that was one of the feelings that a couple of you all brought up um, earlier in this workshop. And what that results in is lower organizational commitment, lower engagement, and higher turnover. So for all of you leaders, you know, um, for the business owners that are on this call, that's intense. That's not what you want to see in your organization, right? Um, and, you know, when we think about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in the workplace, these are things, you know, for HR people in particular, you know, we want to see um, better retention numbers, we want to prevent high turnover, it's expensive, you know, we want to advance, you know, historically excluded talent, you know, that, that can go on and on. Um, however, you know, if isolation, exclusion, and othering is present, that's going to get in the, in the way of those goals, right? Um, in the United States alone, $8 billion is invested by businesses annually to offer DEI learning opportunities to staff. And sadly, most of these offerings miss the mark on creating real social transformation um, because many of them are, are leaving out this human need to belong, though that, that is changing. Um, and I've, I've seen that over the past couple of years really shift um, in looking at these elements of psychological safety and trust and how that contributes to belonging. Um, when we do center belonging as an emotional outcome, our organizations are committed to realize that um, we start to see that needle move in the opposite direction. We start to see increased engagement. We start to see um, greater loyalty to, to a particular business. We start to see more innovation, more creativity. Um, and that translates into better job performance, stronger team cohesion, um, the use of fewer sick days. So again, if like you're in that position as a leader, these are the things you want to see more of, right? Um, research also demonstrates that workplaces can overcome feelings of isolation and exclusion by learning about what gets in the way of feeling a greater sense of safety and trust, offering mentorship and sponsorship from others who have felt similarly in their career, and then having an openness to new strategies intended to improve the situation. So that's just like something to, to kind of consider, to think about, about the power of belonging, the power of psychological safety and trust as it relates to, to feeling this more consistently, in particular for those folks who still feel profoundly unsafe in the workplace. So kind of with all of what we've just discussed, I wanna go into um, a few common microaggressions that are experienced in the workplace and how we can apply some of what we've been introduced around psychological safety and trust um, to kind of to, to problem solve. So if we saw this happen, and chances are some of us may have experienced these microaggressions, or we certainly have bore witness to them. What 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 can we do now uh, with the with the knowledge and some of the frameworks that you have to to change what we see uh, listed in these case studies? So there's three of them, and I think we have enough time to kind of go through each. Um, and I'm going to really rely on engagement in the chat. And the cool thing is if you want to share your voice, you can raise your hand um, and Elaine is gonna be awesome and allow you to, to speak in the webinar, which I would love to hear more voices. So, um, so let's go into, into this practice. And this is where we kind of, as adult learners, 
we can sit through something like this and passively kind of say, okay, this is great, I got it. Um, but it's not until we, we see where we apply it that we start to build the muscle memory to remember how to do this after we're out of the webinar. So let's go, I'm gonna read through three of the case studies I'll share a little bit of kind of like what's going on. And then I'd love for kind of feedback or ideas of how you might apply some of what you've learned um, to, um, to address the situation um, after it takes place. So just kind of can consider that. So this first one is, um, this is around a common racial microaggression um, and it's based on assumptions. So I'm just gonna read through it. And um, what I'd love for you to add in the chat, right? Very low stakes here is just like, how Angela in this case study might feel um, as it relates to being othered or excluded and um, maybe potentially naming one way that you could rebuild trust or at least create some space to rebuild and, and repair after this harm um, to, try to, to try to begin cultivating some of those elements of psychological safety, okay? So those are the two things. So how would Angela feel and one way you can kind of create space to, to repair from this harm. Okay, so this is, the, this is the, um, the case study. So Tony is a new volunteer who is meeting your team for the first time. He greets your supervisor, Angela, who is a black woman and asks, will you be taking notes for today's conversation? Tony then turns to one of your colleagues, Tom, who is a white man and asks, what's on, on today's agenda, boss? assuming that he is your team's leader, even though he is three levels below Angela. Tom chuckles and no one immediately corrects Tony. Okay, so very short, um, but, but very harmful um, scenario that unfortunately is a pretty common racial microaggression. So you're Angela, you know, trying to put yourself in the shoes of Angela, how might you feel in this particular scenario? Um, and just simple words, you know, that come to mind. Um, when, I, when I've done this uh, diminish, thank you, Julianne. Uh, I was just gonna say, when I've done this um, uh, scenario before, I've, I've actually had a few people say, um, because they've experienced this, oh no, not again. You know, like I've been there. Um, and um, so Julianne, thank you for that. Um, other feelings, you know, that, that would pop up for you if this, was, um, if this was your experience in the workplace. Some of the other things, um, typical, right? Yeah, the oh no, not again. Right, so um, overlooked from Van for sure. Angry, hundred percent. Anger, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, a couple of other words that people have come up with uh, is is underestimated, disrespected, overlooked. Um, again, these are just like in the beginning. You know, when I asked you, you know, have you ever felt that that feeling of exclusion? And you name those feelings. This is happening here. This is a this is a significant harm and it destroyed trust, it eroded it completely um, from this new volunteer. Um, Kim, inner thoughts confirmed, right? Like, you know, where, where do I fit in here? You know, like, and right, and confirmed, like this might not be the place for me. That's, that's probably how Angela's feeling in that moment. So um, based on what we talked about with psychological safety, uh, Don says resonates so hard, gender marginalization, yeah. So racial gender microaggression, nice. Yeah, so um, questioning a woman in leadership, questioning a black woman in leadership. Um, so in this scenario, it happens, you know, now you're not in Angela's shoes anymore. You're, you're bearing witness to what just occurred. Um, there isn't an opportunity to engage immediately in the moment. After, after this meeting takes place, what might you do to kind of create some space you know, to check in with Angela, you know, what might you do um, to practice some of what we learned around psychological safety, which feels like it's not present here, right? Uh, to kind of, to, to repair. Yep, so we're, we're still getting some, some kind of feedback on what's going on, um, but what's, what are some of the things that you might do um, around just kind of creating some space to, to repair from this. So Catherine says, talk to Tom. Yeah, so bringing in Tom, um, making it known, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's, Tom is chuckling. Tom is assumed to be the boss here. Tony is the volunteer, right? So, so bringing Tom in, bringing Tony in might be, might be um, something to, to do. Um, 
Jeanette says, apologize for Tony's behavior. Um, Catherine says, sorry, Tony. Yeah, Don says, talk to Angela too. So what I would recommend, you know, before being proactive and thinking, okay, I'm gonna talk to Tom and I'm gonna talk to Tony, check in with the person who was harmed. You know, in this case, checking in with Angela, seeing if she's okay, saying, hey, I noticed this. Um, if possible, if there is space in the meeting, you know, there could be gentle redirection, right? And that would be most ideal. If you feel like that's within your reach and you can do that, and this might be about proximity, there could be other allies in the space, but kind of just, Tony, welcome, you're new here. Angela is our awesome boss. You know, I'm taking notes for this meeting and I really, I really love working for Angela. You know, something that affirms Angela and the role that she plays. If you can do that in the moment, you've put Tony, you've, you've redirected Tony, you put Tom on notice, right? Um, and that there's still some, some after work to be doing with Tom around the chuckling, right? Um, so let's see what else is popping up for people here. Um, so Don says, talk to Angela. Um, yeah, so, so uh, checking in with her, I see you and I saw that, yep, yep. So that could happen after the fact. Um, Kim says, I know you said about what to do after, yeah, there you go. I would in the moment have said, actually Angela is the boss, right? Like, there you go, like gentle redirection. Um, Don says, affirm. Um, Van says repair in the future, doing quick intros to kick off, right? So learning lesson too, like that went sideways. Like how do we prevent that in the future with new volunteers, right? So um, I, like, I like what you all are coming up with here. Um, a really key thing too is um, making the invisible visible, you know, um, if there's space of just kind of like addressing some of the biases that we might have about leadership in general who's in leadership positions, right? Um, if you can go there, um, which I think would be a really good learning opportunity, um, that education and redirection is really key. Practicing this kind of stuff right now, I mean, this is where I wish we were like in a room together because I think like role-playing this out and finding your words is what's going to make you effective in these moments where the bystander effect can happen where you can see this happening and you're like, surely someone else is gonna step up and, and re redirect uh, Tony that Angela's our boss. Surely someone else is, because there's 50 people in the room. But usually like the bystander effect means because and this, the more people that are in the space, the less likely that problematic behavior, harmful behavior will be disrupted. So this is where we, as for, especially for those of us in leadership positions, take right risk, right, in that moment. And I think that was, um, uh, that was Kim who said that in the moment, right? How can you take right risk and redirect? That's what's gonna matter. And that's what's going to make Angela feel like, you know, proximity to allyship, you know, Road spoke up in this moment. I appreciate him, right? That's acts of allyship, right? We talk about allyship being a verb. You know, it's not something, it's not a title we bestow upon ourselves. It's in the moment what do we do as an act of allyship? So kind of thinking about that. So really good work on this, on this case study here and thank you for contributing. Um, so let's go, let's go to the second assumption. This is just kind of, again, kind of how Angela would feel, underestimated, disrespected, overlooked, taking the right risk and making the invisible visible. So kind of like some, some kind of key takeaways that you can have from this. Um, the second piece, the second case uh, study is about pronouns, right? Um, so this is uh, a gender microaggression, and uh, this the scenario is a new team member, Trey, who is a non-binary person, is attending a staff orientation. During the session's introductions, Trey shares their name, their role, and that they use gender-neutral pronouns, they, them. At which point the facilitator laughs and says, you realize your pronouns are grammatically incorrect. So um, this may not have ever happened in your organization. This is a pretty common uh, gender microaggression that targets either trans or non-binary people, um, sometimes gender non-conforming people, gender fluid people. So um, in this moment, if you were Trey, you're, you're a new team member, you know, you're kind of thinking about, I can do the job, I'm going to do the job, I'm not really sure where I fit because this organization hasn't defined its culture. How would you feel in this moment? So just, again, like a couple of words that immediately come to mind for you all. And um, kind of building off of like that kind of opening story when you all were kind of thinking about the feelings um, of exclusion and othering, isolated for sure. We've talked about isolation. 
Um, but I'm just wondering if like other things pop up for you on this one. Belittled, thank you, Catherine. Um, Schnett says furious, yeah, yeah. Enraged, <laughs> angry, yeah, shamed, right? Going to shamed. Um, Sam, as a non-binary person myself, it's completely invalidating. I immediately feel disrespected and like I never fit in. Thank you, Sam, for sharing that. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, this one hit, hits close to home. Uh, Sheila says, uh, freeze, right? Fight, flight, or freeze, frozen, right? I'm new. I, I was excited about this job. I'm not really sure what to do now in this moment. Don says, angry. Um, Gina says, unsafe, right? Going to psychological safety, for sure. Um, Lax says, insensitive. Don says, trust is to in uh, trust in the facilitator is lost. Yeah. Um, they are uneducated. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so there, that, and, you know, so let's, let's kind of think about, um, maybe if we were the facilitator, if you want to kind of focus on that, on that role, or if you bore witness to what, what just took place, you are there. Um, let's start with in the moment, you know, you're there, let's kind of lean into right risk. So you see this happen. Um, it's a staff orientation. So let's just say you're a seasoned staff member and you happen to kind of be observing the orientation. Um, what would be one way to at least create some space to kind of let Trey know that not everybody believes this, right? And that you're disrupting it. So kind of that gentle redirection. So what would you do? Um, so Julianne says, yes, it does make the facilitator look like an idiot and not, not with it, right? Okay. So yeah, the facilitator is pretty out of touch. Um, maybe they're a grammar nerd and they don't know anything about trans or non-binary people in the workplace. That's being generous. Um, you know, this, this seems pretty, pretty intentional, right? So let's just say the facilitator is someone hired from the outside. Um, that, could be, that could be something that could be easily remedied of we're not inviting back the facilitator, but you're observing. So what would be right risk for you in this moment? So Shanette says, thank you. Um, I would actually Google the definition of gendered pronouns and read it out loud to everyone, right? Yeah, it's kind of expansive list of all the pronouns that are out there. Um, you, could, you could also Google, you know, I think the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Webster's Dictionary, all kind of acknowledge the singular they, that's kind of well-treaded territory. So it's like, we, we know this, right? Um, the, let's see, um, uh, Gina, thank you. So um, just kind of stepping in, thank them for sharing their pronouns and share your own, right? So that kind of positive modeling. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's like gentle redirection. Uh, Don says to facilitator, I'd like to discuss your comment afterwards. Yeah, putting on notice, right? It's not like not completely derailing the, the new staff orientation, but you know, I, I noticed what, what just happened. We're gonna discuss this after, right? So if, you're, if you have that ability to, to do that, and I think that that is right risk, um, whether you're in a capital L leadership position or you just happen to be a staff person moving through um, what, what, you just, what you just bore witness to. Um, Glover says, thanks, Don. Yeah. Uh, Julianne, again, staying in the moment, welcoming Trey to the team and gently pointing out that if they is preferred, uh, then they can, they can get used. Uh, even acknowledging that it may be sometimes hard and mistakes get made. Yeah. And, and you know, these are pronouns we use, right? So I, I think all of us, like we talk about the pronouns we use, but it's not like about we prefer this over that. It's like, this is, this is my pronoun. You know, and like in the beginning when I was talking about, there is nothing sweeter than the sound of your own name pronounced correctly and your own pronoun used correctly, right? So, um, so just kind of doing that, uh, doing that kind of uh, education could be really helpful, Julian. So thank you for adding that. Um, and yeah, and just you know, and if you're a leader that um, is successful and and seamlessly using they and them pronouns, maybe using your your own uh, journey of getting um, getting stronger and developing those muscles, you know, to to really affirm people and the pronouns that they use. Um, let's go. Let's see what Kim offers here. So Kim says, I think the facilitator needs to be corrected and educated, but saying that they are an idiot or should be fired is not creating a psychologically safe environment. Uh, where people can make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, making a mistake, and I think it's like understanding, um, 
that if this is an unintentional impact versus an intentional impact, and it's kind of hard with how it's written. So I think that's a good, um, a good call in here of reminding us of like, you know, let's try to educate and redirect. Um, and if there's consistent uh, uh, resistance to that, and in in this scenario, you know, I do a lot of work around gender inclusion. There's often um, a lot of resistance to using uh, gender neutral pronouns and um, people that maliciously are misgendering people using the wrong pronouns saying, oh, you know, I just, it's really hard for me. I just messed up. Um, so there's, you know, I think it's like, you know, being mindful of this facilitator, is there a pattern? Has this occurred before? Um, if it's an outside facilitator, you know, kind of giving feedback and um, setting your expectations of what your values are around affirming people's names and, and pronouns. Um, so there's, there's a little more exploration in that. So I think that that's helpful. Um, Van says, another learning opportunity, integrate into introductions and communications, the practice of pronouns as a norm, right? Hey, I'm Rhodes, I use these pronouns, please share your name, uh, your pronouns if you'd like, something interesting about yourself, you know? Um, so that kind of modeling is really uh, on point. Um, Julianne's giving love to Kim, good point, Kim. And Jeanette says, um, also making a note on the evaluation form that the facilitator gives out um, on their mistake. Yeah, just kind of putting on notice. So um, really good work here. Um, a couple of things, you know, just to kind of, kind of key takeaways from the scenario, um, pronouns, isolated, othered, and humiliated, um, communicate shared norms and values around names and pronouns. And again, making the invisible visible. So just kind of, I love that one kind of call in of like, hey, you know, that comment was made, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk with you about it afterwards, you know, and just kind of other people noting like, okay, that's going to be handled, right? So, um, so that was on pronouns. I'm noticing we've got about eight minutes left. I just want to kind of read through this one. Um, it kind of gets on some generational microaggressions that might resonate for, for some folks here, seeing that I think there's five different generations under any given workplace's roof. So um, communication. So on a recent Zoom call, your supervisor asked your team for ideas on how to advance a project. Many senior leaders jumped in to share their thoughts. You're having a difficult time speaking up and you notice that most junior staff are not sharing their ideas. When one of the youngest team members finally gets the chance to share, your supervisor says, thanks kiddo, and quickly moves on. So, um, if you were the, the kind of younger professional in this situation, um, just kind of quick, you know, words that would kind of pop up for you describing how you would feel in that moment. You're noticing like people around your same age are kind of quiet, you know, the most senior people are speaking and, you know, confidently sharing their ideas. You, you take that right risk of saying, okay, I'm feeling kind of psychologically safe. I'm going to share an idea. And, you know, um, there's, there's a microaggression of, um, uh, kind of treating you and using a, a name that would kind of describe you as a, a young person, you know, and kind of belittling your, uh, the value you bring to your team. And as I say that, I see uh, undervalued. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Shanette, for that. Um, Don says, alone, diminished, underappreciated. Sam says, uh, my, present, my presence isn't valuable here. They don't respect me. Yeah. Um, uh, Leanne says, uh, this happened to me uh, when I was early in my career, I felt dismissed. Yeah. I mean, I think for, for many of us, Van says insulted. Yeah. I think for many of us, like at some point, you know, that transition into the workplace as a younger professional, I would be surprised if someone's, you know, on this, on this piece of generations um, would say, I've never experienced that. You know, I think this is something that we can relate to regardless of our age um, and be a little mindful of, um, and, and disrupting, right? Because many of us may have may have had this experience at some point in our career. So um, you're you bore witness to this. You're in the meeting. You know this is happening. What might be one way to kind of make the invisible visible? Gently redirect. What would you do if you were if you were sitting in this meeting? What would be right risk? Ah, yeah. So Don, I like that. So tell me more about your idea, right? Like. Um, you know, this, the youngest team, one of the youngest team members, you know, is sharing, right? Like, how do we, you know, how do we kind of positively have this person's back? You know, wow, wow, Don, that was a great idea. Thank you so much for sharing. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by X, Y, or Z? You know, that kind of engagement. Um, going back to what someone had said about, 
you know, proximity to a co-conspirator, right? Like in the room, um, you know, what are, what are acts of allyship we can, we can do that acknowledges, wow, that, that young person took a risk and they offered their idea. They, they were belittled by their supervisor. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to say that was a pretty cool idea. You know, I want to hear more about that. Um, open up space. Yeah, I really like that. Okay, so so that's a little, that's like one way to redirect in this scenario. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because um, I'm noticing at least energy and chat is kind of kind of waning a little bit here, but we're, we're coming up to the end. Oh, now, now people are chiming in. Okay, so Jeanette says on Zoom, I would give the thumbs up. Yes, um, thumbs up emojis. Emojis are awesome. I love them. Um, Kim says, even just making eye contact and acknowledging them will be a big difference, right? Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, like head nodding. Or yeah, I mean, like those little nonverbals, especially like if you are physically in a room, you know, we respond to those as well, right? So I, I, I like that. Um, sorry, I didn't realize it was on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and if it's on Zoom, you know, like I love the emojis that, that Jeanette was talking about there. Um, there's lots of creative ways that, that we can have each other's backs. Um, and in particular, you know, if someone is being excluded, how we can, how we can disrupt that. So um, I think this is really good work. I want to kind of end here, knowing that we've got um, we've got about four minutes left, and this is a time for your any other questions, um, uh, uh, ideas, things of that nature. Um, my contact uh, information is up on the screen. I know that that's probably going to be shared later. Um, the book that a lot of this is based off of is called Belonging at Work. So if you'd like to check that out, it's available in most places where you can consume books online. Um, and I feature uh, the Belonging Network Summit from last month, but I, I, that's, that's an event I do every year. So if you like these kind of um, exchanges, um, it's, a, it's a free summit we put on um, to talk more, to explore the concepts of, of belonging and what happens when belonging um, isn't in place in workplaces. So uh, lots of different thought leaders come together for that summit. So questions, things that have popped up. Um, Elaine, if we could, if anyone has their hands up, you know, I, I welcome hearing some voices because there's been some good participation in the chat. So, um, you know, even if you want to say hi, I'd love to hear from a few of you. I totally agree, Rhodes. You, we had some really great participation. It was so nice that everybody was so active in the chats. Um, I know that we're getting to the point where people are a little zoomed out and um, being virtual is um, daunting. So I just want to give everyone a big round of applause and appreciate, you know, your, your engagement in this platform. Yeah. Um, if anybody would like to make a comment or talk to, you know, Rhodes directly, go ahead and raise your hand up. Oh, and I see a hand is raised. Awesome. Thank Ooh, you. Wait, where did, where did they go? No. Wait, 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 wait. There it is. Ah, uh, Shna, hey, go for hey. it. Hey. I just want to say thank you for putting on this workshop because we were just talking about this in our one of our staff meetings yesterday. Um, during our all staff meeting, we went into these breakout rooms and in the breakout rooms, I don't know why, for some reason I always get stuck with, not stuck, but the CEO always ends up in our breakout room. Mm -hmm. And even though she said, you know, I'm not writing down names, I'm just here to take notes. She's supposed to be the official note taker for the room. And it was like really, really quiet. And nobody really felt safe to say anything. So. I'm definitely going to bring this concept up on how we can build that safety and psychological work that needs to be done because it's definitely not there at, at my organization. Yeah, Jeanette, thank you for sharing that. And um, I don't know if you've read this book, um, Tiffany, Jana, and um, Michael Michael Barron, Subtle Acts of Exclusion. This book is awesome. Um, well, it's sobering, right? It's a lot of the things you'll read and be like, yep, yep. Um, but it talks about lots of different forms of microaggressions and the way that they describe microaggressions is subtle acts of exclusion. And what I think is really good about this book is it's not only like naming the things that we don't wanna see happen in the workplace, it gives you frameworks on how to respond to them and how to recover, you know, what, and to, to redirect and do that kind of education. So as you all continue to do that work in your organization, I highly, highly recommend this book as just like a place to start and maybe have some discussions with your leadership team around. So definitely check it out. And, and thank you for adding that and being so engaged in the chat. I really appreciate you. 
Uh, thank well, I appreciate you and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, and it looks like there's there's some other, I don't know if there's other hands, Elaine, um, but I'm seeing some things pop up in the chat. So I see um, uh, Sheila says, just hearing the vocabulary, we need to develop a, whole, a holy or holistic language um, when we are with each other, um, supporting each other in the way forward. Yeah, I really like that. And I see how you use holy there. So I like that. So um, uh, Van says, uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for being here, Van. I appreciate that. Uh, Lack says, thank you for the session. Have a great day. Thank you, Lack. Um, Kim says, amazing presentation, Rhodes. You're very good at bringing everyone present into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. You, you offered a lot in the chat. Uh, Lack says, wonder, uh, we are going to get this recording. Um, Elaine, I think, yeah, yeah, I think this is recorded. So you get, you get more if you want more. Um, Sam says, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate what you added. Elaine says, uh, yes. So, oh, yeah, thanks, Elaine. <laughs> You're like, I got that. Uh, lots of thank yous. Thank you all. Um, Leanne says, I'm interested how your work and the idea of psychological safety has had to shift in the virtual workplace. I found leading creative teams in a virtual environment more challenging than in real life. How do you create safety virtually versus in person? So Leanne, there, um, that's, that's a whole other workshop. And um, if you go to my website, roadsperry.com, and you go to the blog, there's um, a couple of um, blog posts around how do we create the sense of psychological safety, trust, and belonging in a virtual environment. So that can give you some good ideas. And that was developed by a community that I run of about 60 people, like really crowdsourcing ideas on what's working right now, recognizing that a lot of this is just promising practices because so much has changed. And now we're talking about hybrid workplaces. So definitely check that out as a starting place. And you know, if you want to chat more about that, I'm happy to, to talk with you. Um, what else? What else? Yeah. Okay. So very cool. I'm seeing I'm seeing commitments around build, becoming stronger leaders, and um, yeah, this is great. So it looks like a lot of folks. Twenty five people are still here. So I don't know, Elaine. If there's any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes. We we do have two hands raised. So let me okay. give Catherine a chance to chat. Sure. Oh, they're both gone. Oh no. <laughs> so sorry. Oh. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. And actually, I said that I have a few more minutes, and I think I actually have another meeting right now. So <laughs> no worries. If if people have additional questions, I really encourage you to reach out to Rhodes, you know, directly via LinkedIn, um, his website, um, and you, if those of you that may have missed, you know, a portion of the event, we'll definitely be sending out the link to the recording so that you can share. Um, with colleagues and allies and those that you think um, could learn a lot from these ins inspirational words. Thank you so much, Rhodes, for your time today. And thanks okay. to everyone that joined us. Um, let's continue making, you know, work a safe place. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you so much. All right. Take Bye. care. Bye.